if you were sitting in a church that every Sunday told you about how to prosper and how to, I don't know, bat your eyelashes, how on earth would you know what you are looking for, even if we call it the spirit of Antichrist, if you're not studying this? In the types and antitypes, which is important for us to study, it's almost a setup to learn a little bit about the mind, the person um, who will come to know, revealed to us as Antichrist in the Bible. And when I say types and antitypes, for example, we would say that Pharaoh would be a type, if you will, uh, an earthly ruler that denies God or God's power. And there are many of these peppered through the scriptures, and they're there for a reason. They're not just there because God wanted to include the good, the bad, and the ugly. They're there to show us what Satan looks like, what the prince of the power of the air looks like, and the spirit that comes out of that, which is the spirit of Antichrist. Always just right on the cusp, if you line up two images, the true image that is what God put forth and whatever Satan does, which is just a little bit off, just a little bit blurry, close enough that the words of Christ, even the very elect, through, that runs through the New Testament could be deceived. Well, how could they be deceived? Again, you come back to see, if you go back to the garden, it happens very easily. I'm not saying that, we've talked about this before, I'm not saying that um, had Adam not led Eve out of his sight, would the event of the fall Still, would that have happened? I don't know. No, no one can say, but it happened that way. And if you go back to the spirit of that, it was to get Eve to doubt. Did God really say that? Did he really mean that? And that's what the devil's been doing since the beginning, and that's what the spirit of Antichrist will usher in, except it'll be not did God really say, it'll be I am that appears on the stage in history declaring, I am a revelation, not just any revelation, but I am a revelation of God. So that spirit is tucked in in the pages, as I said, of the Old Testament. So type and antitype, the names that we encounter, they all become important in looking at the final things. For example, in the prophecies, when we are looking in the Old Testament, in the prophecies, for example, of Balaam, there is a type if you want to call it that of Antichrist, referred to as Asher. Do not be surprised that name is connected to Assyria. And there's much to say about that as we move to kind of understand who is Antichrist. Uh, Job refers, there's a, a message in Job, a verse in Job, where he is referred to as the crooked serpent. And again, that appears again in Isaiah 27. The crooked serpent is connected with the dragon. Uh, sometimes in Psalm 5, verse 6, there is a verse there called, it says, bloody and deceitful man, but really in the Hebrew it reads, the man of bloods and deceit. There's all kinds of interesting names, the man of the earth, the adversary. Isaiah refers to him in various places as the Assyrian. Now be very careful here because sometimes prophecy has a double fulfillment. That which was given in the day to occur, for example, the people being, carry, being carried off by the Assyrians, and a double fulfillment as a type of Antichrist, still yet to be fulfilled. So there, there is a law of double fulfillment. There could even be triple meaning to a verse, but it's always going to be something that was given for that time, something that is yet to happen. Those are at least minimally two. And if there's a third prong, it could be an event that happens after, so, and so on. I think you get what I'm trying to say. Um, other places he's called the rod of God's anger in Isaiah 10, the king of Babylon, the spoiler, the destroyer, the enemy, the cruel one, the wicked one, lots of names. Don't you think it's interesting that God has lots of names too? It's always the super imitator copycat, right? Ezekiel refers to him as the prince of Tyre, as well as the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. 
Daniel gives us a little bit more detail and will fully investigate what he says. I will mention some things today. This is a little bit more overview, so we'll keep things a little bit more general or generic today, but I'm mentioning things that we have to go into detail. Daniel is one of them. Uh, but he says a lot on the subject, the type, if you will, of Antichrist. Uh, Hosea calls him the king of princes, as well as the merchant, in whose hands are the balances of deceit, who loves to oppress. Uh, Joel describes him as the head of the North Army. Remember, there's double fulfillment there. Um, and then we have in other writings, for example, Amos, he's referred to as the adversary, ha ha uh, Habakkuk, the proud man. Nahum, Nahum calls him Belial, Zechariah, he is the idol shepherd or the spirit of the idol shepherd uh, upon whom God pronounces woes and judgments. Now what's interesting is that you read of Christ who said many would come in his name. And this is what I was referring to. And part of that, Paul fills in, the Apostle Paul fills in when he uh, uses the name, the man of sin or the son of perdition, whose coming shall be after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So let me ask you a question. If you were sitting in a church that every Sunday told you about how to prosper and how to, I don't know, bat your eyelashes, how on earth would you know what you are looking for, even if we call it the spirit of Antichrist, if you're not studying this? In 1 John 2, 22, uh, John says that he will both deny the Father and the Son. By the time we're reading the book of Revelation, it is though a convergence of all the titles through this whole book will be wadded up together the beast, the false prophet, and the devil himself meet their end ultimately in the lake of fire. Now, there are those people right now who are preaching or teaching people that this has already happened. And there's a lot of them out there. It's already happened. We're just waiting for one more event and then the end is going to come. I got to tell you, if Satan, and let's just call it the unholy trinity, if they were all tossed in the lake of fire, I, I kind of think that we believers would know it. Do you know how? We wouldn't be uh, under the constant molestation, the fiery darts, the attacks. We wouldn't be under any of that. We'd be walking basically in wholeness. That has not happened yet. Anybody in their right mind want to tell me that Satan has already been bound? Okay, let's come back to that in a minute, okay? Not all are convinced here, I guess. Second chapter of John, he says, Little children, it is the last time as you have heard that Antichrist, Antichrists, plural, shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists by, whereby we know it is the last time. And... When John was writing this, it would have been people appearing on the scene in John's day saying, I am the Christ, or preaching as though they were speaking as God. That was already happening in John's day. That's why he wrote that. But the spirit itself comes from one singular place, not from multiple. It's one singular spirit, just like the spirit of God Coming into the believer, this is that same and singular spirit peppered through the Bible. So if we can recognize a bit of it, understand a little bit of it, uh, Paul referred to this as the mystery of iniquity that was already working in his day. And then there are those people that are interpreting prophecy. They refer to people who are already in the past or historic figures and Basically, they believe they've already fulfilled the description of Antichrist. How many people here have a couple of commentaries, Bible commentaries, in your house or on your phone? Anybody? Okay, it's a couple of you. So that's the first telltale sign if you're reading any work that puts historic figures. I'm not talking about in the book of Revelation. 
I'm not talking about the interpretation of the seven churches. I'm talking about everything that happens after the fourth chapter going forward. Somebody who's writing and saying, this event happened in this and this date. Those are people who believe the book has, everything in the book has already come to pass. Historic interpretation, if you want to put it that way. And I'd go so far as to say, it may be my only commentary on interpretation. That is the singular interpretation that I would say of all the different interpretations is quite demonic. Because it does not look for any future events to take place. And within that, yes, there are subcategories. People believe everything's happened, but we're just waiting for the return of Christ. Well, if everything's happened, I'd like to know when the locust demons appeared to you, what did they actually look like? Don't answer. I'm sorry, but the reason for sarcasm is it shows you the insanity of some of these people out there who would like to tell you they have knowledge that they don't possess because what they're saying is actually word salad. All right. And, you know, listen, if you want to listen to the vice president talk to you about prophecy. <laughs> and then all the people who are riding in the yellow school bus, they're great, aren't they? All right. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> So we have to be careful when we are studying and interpreting. Everything that I'm laying down here is to try and uh, get a better understanding. For example, when we get into the book of Daniel, it'll be a, a, a lot of review for many of you who have been in the congregation. It'll be brand new for those who have not been uh, any time, say, beyond 10 years with the congregation here. But in the book of Daniel, Daniel unfolds as he's basically describing what Nebuchadnezzar sees as this statue. He unfolds and kind of reveals to us it is prophetically unfolding the history of now what has already happened. And there is an element that has not yet come to pass, but everything that he said of the nations that would basically take over and give way into other nations, culminating at the last, uh, if you want to call it, takeover by Alexander the Great, What's important is that in Daniel's writing, when we are interpreting the historical that's already happened, Alexander the Great, for example, it's implied in the text. We could look at it and say the, the implication is that each of these world rulers may have been driven by that same spirit that will rise its head or raise its head again in the last days. It's impossible if you really are looking at history, not what people would like history to say. It's impossible to look at just what Alexander the Great did. Just look and, again, it, you could make the argument that this person just had a natural finesse, had natural understanding of military um, alignments, how, the how-tos. People paint Alexander the Great as this great mastermind. Okay, as a young boy, he was at, at uh, odds, if you will, with his father, who he was going to potentially or would have been heir, but the father had to be taken out of the way, so the father's assassinated. Alexander the Great rises to power, and this young man sets out, and each place that he conquers, it's almost like this unsatiable desire or a thirst that can't be quenched to keep conquering. Had he not died... He would have restored Babylon. He would have rebuilt Babylon to all of its splendor, and he would have kept conquering. You tell me that that's not a mindset that has not reoccurred again and again and again on the stage of human history. And look at those who were possessed by that spirit, and please don't tell me that that's just an oddity because you see the same spirit, world domination, to take over, and maybe the, we'll call it the base maniacal mind varied from person to person, but the drive to dominate the world, to take over. That was Alexander the Great's drive. And people say, oh, military genius, great guy. But I think if you look at today, for example, just look at the globalist drive, this push for us all to be put into the same pipeline. This, by the way, is the same demonic mindset that as Daniel is interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the statue, 
you're going to see these world leaders have this same force. It's a driving force. So uh, we need to be very careful when we're looking at this to make sure that we're understanding just as God, when he created the earth, his design was for perfection for the creation, which was marred. Satan's uh, appearing, and that same spirit, we'll call it now that antichrist, that substitute deliverer mindset, paints the picture that this way is much better than God's way. So there's a lot as we comb the scriptures that could, um, we can make great arguments, for example, that when people talk about historic interpretation of things yet to come, they'll say things like, well, for Antichrist, Nero completely fit the bill, blah, blah, blah. Yes, but he didn't do and didn't fulfill what it says Antichrist must do. So although he may have possessed that spirit, he was not Antichrist. Does that make sense? Yes. Yet you will read a lot of books that, if they're historic, they'll identify a personage and they'll say, and no one has risen to the, to the ranks of evil such as this person. Well, I don't care. Find me any human being, whether you want to point at uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, or you want to point at Adolf Hitler, I don't care. Find me a person that you think is the most evil on earth, and I'll tell you they're only scratching the surface of what a human is capable of because that power doesn't come from a human. It's coming from a different source, just as a person of God can be fueled or powered by the Holy Spirit. So it's important to kind of put this all in perspective. The undercurrent, as I said, of world domination, control of populace, of extinguishing personal faith, which we're seeing, that is the spirit of Antichrist. That's not Antichrist just yet. It is the spirit. Just as John said it's at work, it is still at work. So I'm going to say it like this. Let nobody deceive you. We are still looking at what is yet to come. Now let me put some weird and interesting things out there. I think they're weird and interesting in my eyes. They may not be to you, but I just, you read something and then you, you go back and you see it again in a different light. So John 5, and uh, we have Jesus in John 5. If you remember, on the heels of Jesus healing the sick man at the uh, pool, Bethesda, and after he heals the man, the religious people, they want to kill him. That verse 18 says, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because not only had he broken the Sabbath, but he also said God was his father, making him equal, making himself equal with God. But there's something in here, in this passage, in this fifth chapter, that I find very interesting. You see, he basically says, if you look at, Five in 543, but I'm going to read just a little bit before this. He says, um, but I know you, beginning at verse 42, you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If, if another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. Now just think about that for a second, because he says, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that, uh, that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For, for had ye believed Moses, you would, have, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. So he's saying, in essence, you won't take my word, but somebody else could just walk up to you and say, I am, or whatever, and you'd believe him. Which leads me to think that when Jesus was talking about this, he was basically saying, because he says this in not just one place, but he alludes to it in two or three other places, it seems to me that there's a setup that kind of says, possibly because both for the Jew who is waiting for Messiah to come, and for Christians in name only, those people who don't care to know anything about the Bible. They are your dogmatic Christmas people. It's, you know, I come to church on Christmas and maybe Easter. That's it. And if I come out for Lent, it's a good thing. I might give it up. All right. Uh, the point here is that it's very clear. He's saying, essentially, the possibility that somebody else might come and you'd receive him. You'd accept him. 
that lets me to believe that just as Christ is saying this, the likelihood that he's also saying, you who are waiting for Messiah, just wait because they'll be receiving him with open arms. They will, just like many Christians who don't study and know anything. And Wow, did you, did you hear what he said? Did you see the things he did? He's done these. It's God, this has got to be God. Look at, look at what he has done. No mortal could do this. So this is why I tell you there's much to glean even from passages we've already read to give you this kind of idea even, even the fact that they were angry with Jesus for healing a man, you could say, well, they said he broke the law because it was the Sabbath. But don't you think you'd have to be a little bit demonic? I'm not, I'm not saying they were full orb, but don't you think you'd have to have a little bit of demonic in you to not go, praise God, I don't care what day it is, this man's been healed, right? Well, it's the law. You can't break the law, but yet these are the same people who broke the law all the time. So, you know, it's kind of like our government, selective... <laughs> You never knew that the government and the Pharisees and the religious folks there in Jesus' day had so much in common, did you? Um, so what's interesting, though, is, as I said, they make threats. They, they want to kill him now. And he responds. There are three things he says in this passage that basically testify of him. He says, um, John who he it says here, you sent, you sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth, that would be referring to Christ, of, he says, of a, I have a greater witness than that of John, the works which the Father hath given me, so the Father, the scriptures which testify of me, verse 39 and 40. So this whole passage, he's saying, essentially, how much more proof do you need? And still they were like, no. We, we wouldn't receive you even if you were standing here telling us that you're God. We still wouldn't, or the Messiah, we still wouldn't receive you. So it's that mindset that tells me, how is it, for example, that a man like Nicodemus could see, or even Peter could see, but these could not? And again, that goes back to God's prerogative. So it's important for us to make sure we are looking at every part of Scripture to understand even the subtleties of rejection carry a dimension of that, we'll call it pseudo, this pseudo-Messiah mindset, if you want to say it like that. Um, okay, so if we kind of try and get a better perspective of Antichrist, we see, obviously, he will be an imitation, as I said, and there will also be some marked contrasts as he appears. For example, we look at the return of Christ, and clearly the return of Christ says he will, he will come from above, right? And when we're reading in Revelation, interestingly enough, don't ask me how the manifestation, but definitely it says the beast that comes from basically ascending from underneath the earth, whatever that is. So we do have some distinctions. Um, the, as I said, the, the reference I'm using is Revelation 11.7. As Jesus came in the name of the Father and glorified the Father, revealed the Father to us, when the Antichrist comes, he will not be revealing anything except himself. <laughs> I know people like that, by the way. <laughs> They're so full of themselves. But he will basically glorify himself, uh, be very proud of it, oppose God in every way, but his desire to receive the praise and the worship that belongs to God so not enough just to appear on the scene, but he wants everything, again, to usurp. He's the great usurper. From about the second century forward, the bulk of writings on the subject of Antichrist identify him as a real person. So for those of you who unfortunately may have materials that make the Antichrist some personification of an inanimate object, no, that's not the way it happens, all right? It's a person we're talking about. We know the Bible gives us enough information to know where the Antichrist will most likely come from or what country he will herald from or what, we'll call it, preferences that he may have. So we're talking about a person, not a thing, uh, or not just a random people refer to Antichrist and say the power. No, 
the person of Antichrist. Um, in the period that marks the pre-Reformation years, so that would be you know, through the time of Martin Luther, those that were looking into the book of Revelation, and I can see how they did it, they saw that the Antichrist had to be the Pope. All right? So you're going to read a lot of writing. If you're going to read history, uh, listen, I have a ton of Martin Luther material. Uh, we had an exhibit here where Martin Luther calls the Pope the Antichrist, straight up. And you think, is that parody, or did he really believe that? No, they really believed that. Now, I'm not saying, and you've got to, got to listen to me, because you know I'm not a Pope fan, okay? And I'm not a Pope fan for many reasons, not just because that's Catholicism and we're Protestant. No, not, not because of that. I cannot, I cannot tell you how disconcerting it is, and I've said this many times already, that a person who is charged with handling the word of God thinks climate change is a bigger threat. When we know, listen, you can believe whatever you want, but if you're actually going to look into climate change, and I highly, really suggest that you do, you'll find that the people who are touting climate change have not done their research at all. And I'm going to just leave that one alone because I don't want to be talking about it, okay? That's for you to dig and find out that the whole world has gone mad. They're upside down, but that's just a story for another day. So in the period, if you're looking historically, you're going to find a lot, probably from about the time it was already happening during Wycliffe's day. They were already looking at the papacy and saying, nah, this is not good. Uh, by the time Martin Luther comes around, indulgences are being sold. So basically, you know, if you pay, you can get your loved ones out of purgatory and you can spring them out of hell and they can have their best life too, right? <laughs> so <laughs> just got to love what goes on here. So it's understandable that you're seeing all this corruption and abuse. It's understandable that you'd look at some of these people and say, they're of the devil. When that, I'm nobody's judge. That may be so. Uh, but... Here's what we have to be mindful of, and I'm, this is not a defense of the Catholic Church, not a defense of the Catholic Church, but the reason why it could not be the depiction, yes, it, 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 what we're looking at in Revelation, uh, say, 17, the, per, the passages we looked at, the two chapters, yes, it is false religion, but it is not limited to, and don't think that the Protestants aren't just as guilty as the Catholics, or the Jews were all guilty of false religion and we'll call it all the frills. We're, we're all guilty of that. There isn't a soul alive when people come in this door and they say, well, you don't, you don't do altar calls and you don't have all this, this ceremonial stuff, right? Because we're trying to stay as close to the book as possible. And I'm telling you, even stripping back all the garbage that everybody else does, we still have issues. So... The reason, though, that the Catholic Church could not be the depiction of what's in this book, John says the Antichrist will deny the Father and the Son. You know what? The Catholic Church has done a lot of messed up things, but they've never denied the Father and the Son. Just think about that. So... When I say it is more of a religious problem, it's a religious problem that encompasses all false religions put together, not singled out as one particular group. And as I say, I'm going to just repeat this for people who are hard-headed. The Protestant church hurt the body of Christ. Maybe for not as long because the Protestant church hasn't, has not existed for as long as the whole Roman Catholic Church has existed in its entirety. But we've done our damage. We, we have managed to do our own damage. So I'm not going to stand here and throw stones at one group of people when I can look and see the Protestant Church has done its fair share. And I'm going to go a little bit further and say the Protestant Church, if the Catholic Church has done its share, the Protestant Church has done its share to scripturally, excuse me, but booger people's minds into concepts that are not doctrinal. They are not even biblical. And you might say, well, how so? You'll find out. I'll present them to you. So we're, we're, 
we're no Mother Teresa here either. Don't think I'm just throwing the stones over there. It's everywhere. So it is important for us, as I said, to look at these references, old and new. When we get into the book of Daniel, and I said I'm just kind of touching things today because there, there's a lot of work both in the translation and the unfolding of Daniel that needs to be done. But when you get into the book of Daniel, it talks about how a covenant will be made and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's referring to that last seven-year period when we, we talk about 70 weeks of years. I'll have to explain this for people who don't know what that is, not in this message. But the last seven years, and if you're a person who's got a little bit of understanding, those last seven years are divided into a halfway point, the three and a half years of the last seven years, which is what we're dealing with in the book of Revelation once the seals begin to be opened, right? There are seven seals on a, we'll call it a scroll, sealed, writing on the back and the front, and just so we can make some connections. If you read in the book of Daniel, I'm sure many of you know this, but many of you may not know this. So in the book of Daniel, when it says, Daniel 12 and verse 4, but thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, knowledge shall be increased. Well, that sealing up of the book, who knows where this book went, but it had to be in heaven because this is the book that will reappear where no one is around to open it in the, in the opening unfolding beginning with the first seals in the book of Revelation, this is basically what God told Daniel to seal up, which I would say writing on back and front with the seven seals, keeping it shut, title deed to the world with the rest of the story in it of how the world ends somehow, sealed up here, However, this maybe goes to heaven, or I don't know. Don't ask me, I don't know, because it does reappear in what John sees. And there was nobody to open the scroll. Lots of weeping going on until it was pointed out that only the Lamb, which is Jesus Christ, could open up the title deed to the world to redeem it and all that will be left in it at that time. So even the connections, that's why it's important, we keep, I keep saying this, you need Daniel and Ezekiel and a couple of other books actually to put this all together to make it all flow because you can see, if you're reading it like I'm showing you, you can actually see the unfolding of all of this with greater clarity. And that's what I love about approaching the scripture like this. You make these connections right away so that you're not saying, well, where did this come from? Or, or where does this symbol belong? We've already seen it in the book of Daniel. Go to the book of Revelation and you read in the book of Revelation just to show you to make a, a connection that's clear and markedly unambiguous. You get to uh, Revelation 4 and, I'm sorry, verse f chapter 5, and I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. There is what Daniel was told to shut up and Daniel wouldn't have been able to understand it anyway. The time was not yet. So these are, like I said, they're, they're through the Bible. So when people say, well, I'm not sure about the right interpretation of something, that's why I said the Bible will confirm itself. So when you hear people teaching about things that are not, they're not biblical. I'll give you another example, because I mentioned this, I might as well just say it and put it out there. Look very carefully at something that has already occurred in the past. Noah. God says, I'm going to send a flood on the earth because the evil that is in man, basically more than God can bear, he's going to send a flood and basically judge the earth and the people of the earth. Noah, you build this ark, you and your family and whatever I tell you to put in it, so right away, right at the beginning, God is showing he can choose the people 
to not incur or undergo like Noah, they were safe in the ark, like we are safe in Christ. And we can see this very clearly. God set out to basically eradicate the evil. And that didn't do it, by the way, but God said, I'll send this sign of the rainbow is the covenant God said, I will not. Very important. God actually, when he says something, got to pay attention. He says, I won't do that again. I won't destroy the world with a flood again. So anybody who's thinking the world's going to end with a cataclysmic flood, he ain't written the Bible. I'm not going to do that one again. That's his word. But it does say he's going to burn up the earth. So for all of you climate people, just go there. Oh, what a waste. You mean I could have been doing other things and not worrying about this old earth burning up because it's going to burn up anyway? Yep. Okay. So, if we are really looking, we know that Antichrist will plant tabernacles, residences, structures, if you will, of his palace between seas, probably between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. In Daniel 7.21, there's a, a reference to this. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came, and the judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and at that time came the saints and possessed the kingdom, or to possess the kingdom. And then again, Daniel 8, 19 places this reference, the last end of the indignation, God's wrath poured out on the earth. So again, just have to line things up properly, and then you can see this hasn't happened yet. It's impossible. Daniel 9 reveals that he will make his covenant beginning in the last period, as I'm describing, the seven weeks of years, in the middle of the week, most likely. We have some references we need to pick apart and parse. So as I said today, I'm keeping it kind of generic. We have to get into the weeds of this, though, because that's where the details really matter. Um, the reason why we, we might say that the religious institutions have uh, sometimes associated these passages with the spirit of Antichrist is because they are associated. If you go back and you read Daniel, you'll see clearly there are references, as I mentioned probably 20-some minutes ago, for example, the reference to Alexander the Great. It is the same spirit, and that's that reference we will have to pick apart and look at as well. So when we start trying to piece this together, remember I was talking about the Catholic Church, and I said, it. yes, we're looking at false religion in the book of Revelation, but why it cannot be singularly the Catholic Church as many, gosh, probably at least 70% of my commentaries of all the things, books I have, point to the Catholic Church, which I think is a mistake. Yes, they're part of the false religion. As I said, the Protestants, even the Jews. But if you think about it, people who actually are practicing Catholicism are reciting Catholics love creeds, right? You know that. They love creeds and repetition. Hail Mary, repetition, creeds. Well, the Council of Trent basically gave a creed that real practicing Catholics, not the ones that say I'm a Catholic and then go and eat ice cream and promote abortion. Uh, that might hit you of who I'm talking about in a minute. Where did that come from? I have no idea. But the creed says, I believe in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. That is from the Council of Trent. That's why I said you be careful. You can handle the scripture so sloppily that because somebody said that, oh, yeah, well, that, that, that would make sense. And again, the picture of purple, the purple, the color purple, that's just a symbol to tell you, for example, that we've got this ecumenical picture that is presenting itself as deity, basically pseudo or replacement of God. We no longer need God, God. The world is finding its own God, and whether that's in climate change, in the church, however you want to paint that. So, and we'll get into this more in detail, but from all the passage, passages I've referenced out of Daniel, you then go into Revelation, and you read what Revelation 13 says, because a lot of the passages I've quoted out of Daniel, 
You find their counterpart here. So for example, in Revelation 13, um, John is writing and he says, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having even heads and ten horns, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his head the names of blasphemy, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, I hope to show, and we'll do this because I'd like to line up the passages to show you out of Daniel and Revelation where you can connect the passages and see we're talking about the same thing here. It's nothing, there's, there's nothing new that's being introduced. If you compare Daniel with chapter 13 that I just read and in 12.9, which is the chapter before, in 12.9 it says, And the great dragon was cast out, and that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, was cast out in, into the earth, and his angels cast out with him. So we have clarity on who we are dealing with. Not ambiguous. Um, of course, when I was talking about the copycat scenario, right? Because Satan and the spirit of Antichrist, it's always something that is the instead of. Christ will give you this. So, for example, we're told about the 144,000. They receive a mark so they should not be hurt. Meanwhile, the rest of the people are forced to take what? The mark of the beast. You make all of these comparisons and you can see, as I said, there are great similarities in copying and then there are these great antithesis, they're, they're put in there for us to see and recognize. And that's why I said to you, it blows my mind that people will not study this book because if you have good theology, sound doctrine through the rest of the Bible, you come into this and it's like cutting through, like a, a fast boat cutting through water, leaving a wake behind because you're cutting through all the garbage and all the noise that people have put in here that doesn't belong in here in the first place. So it drives me crazy, by the way. It really just drives me crazy. So, okay, back to my message here. Um, I would also like people to do one thing, because I will have to show you, and we have to line up, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I will do this. I need to have almost like a map has a legend to give you certain things that are already confirmed in here. We already know what they represent. And whether they are confirmed by other scriptures in the book or they are confirmed within the book itself. For example, many places it says a symbol which is. For example, the seven angels which are. And they'll go on to elaborate. So it's, there are self explaining passages of symbols, and then there are those we go to the rest of the scripture. I'd like to make that legend for you so that as we go through the book, you keep that legend in your Bible with you so you can open up, and if you're not sure, you can check, or even in your own time, what these symbols are. For example, many times we read about the, the waters or the sand of the sea that's usually referring to a body of people. And then we get a lot of confusion. People talk about the trumpets that are blown. Please do not con confuse the trumpets that are blown in this book and homogenize them with other, what you think are trumpets, which may be horns, which have a different name. So there's, there's reason to make a legend to show you why understanding what the symbols mean before you get out the gate will be very helpful for all of us. Um, okay, one more thing. You know, I quoted what Jesus was saying, but there are places, especially where we read about God sending a strong delusion and people believing a lie. That's going to be more, more than what we actually think. I think a lot of times we romanticize what, what God will or will not do. But the reality is God spells out that the way in, what does it say? Very few people can find it. It doesn't mean, here's the thing, it doesn't mean that because somebody just shows up, as I said, uh, I'm here and I grace, I grace you with my presence today, but I never take the time to learn about God, which goes back to something I have said for 
now 19 years, and it's been said here before that. How do you get how do you get into a relationship with somebody? What do you do to make a relationship? You have to spend time with that person and get to know them. You want to get to know God? You've got to spend time in the book. That's how you, you don't get to know God by just standing out on a street corner and going. <laughs> you might get to know what bugs you've ingested. <laughs> so there are some real important reasons to, to do, I would say almost methodically, which right now you might be saying, wow, it's kind of piecemeal. You gave us a whole bunch of things here. No, I want to identify. We already know Christ is the lamb. Christ is the lamb. He's also the lion. There's one for you. Christ, the lion from the tribe of Judah. Then we read, Peter writes, that the devil is a roaring lion seeking to devour whom he may. Again, just use a little bit of my title. Just usurp me a little bit. This is powerful when you consider that if we line all this up, it is the reason why whoever remains, there is the very good likelihood if they don't know what we're discussing here and what's being taught unvarnished, uh, there'll be a lot of people just kind of succumb to this personage who appears on the scene of history with having all the markings of what I'd say is the caricatured version of how people might perceive the Messiah. When, you, when that starts to sink in, you'll say that's the reason, that's reason enough to study, and that's reason enough to share it with people because you'd want to warn people if you could. But then again, there are people who don't want to hear about this, and that's okay too. I'm, I'm not going to force feed you. You don't want to know about this? Good for you. And we'll see how that works out for you. All right. Um, you're going to hear me reference horns. I just did. I read a passage about horns. Uh, we're going to read and study about that. There is a passage that talks about ten kings who will reign with the beast. Uh, and this will be that these will be in complete alignment with him. Then the New Testament, the reference says, they shall hate the whore. Go back to that ecumenical reference I just said, false religion. Uh, if that's the papacy, which I told you it's not, but if that's the papacy, it says, and shall make her desolate, naked, and eat her flesh, and burn her with fire, doesn't make much sense, because even in the crazy universe of the Catholic Church, they've never gone that far. It's always subtlety to engage with, we'll call it the social issues of the day. So that doesn't really fit the narrative. You've got to look for something else somewhere else. Again, as I said, false religion. Now there are many people that are trying to make the case uh, because of references that can be taken out of context. There are many people trying to make the case that this uh, false picture, the false religion, and they want to single out one group of people and they'll say, well, that's the Muslims, that's Islam right there. No, I'm sorry, that's not. It can represent false religion, but read carefully what that says. So again, I'm not, I'm not out here wanting to lob stuff at people unnecessarily. I do enough of that when it's necessary, right? Um, okay. I also said a mouthful when I said what Christ said in John 5.43, which makes it sound like Jesus is alluding to something that these people might be a little bit more amenable, the religious-minded people who are not in spirit, they are in letter of law, might be more interested in receiving the imposter than receiving the real deal. Now, don't, I'm not isolating and saying only those religious people because this will also translate and spill over to people who I said are Christian in name only. I guess you could make the case that Chinos, Christians in name only, and Genos, Jews in name only, have something in common, all right? Because I, for example, I know people who say they are of the Jewish faith. They identify as Jewish, but they don't practice. And in fact, wait for it, they are atheists. Wait, so let me get this straight. You identify as Jewish, but you're atheist because you don't believe in God, so how could you be Jewish? Well, I just identify with Judaism because I like all the social stuff that goes with it. Oh, okay, all right. So when Antichrist appears and goes, oh, look, 
right? Precious people, whatever they do, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that person's going to be like, <laughs> right? Okay. So I have nothing to say. <laughs> don't say I didn't try to warn you. So when I say he will be a man, he will be more than a man. But remember, he's an imposter, an imitator. So just as Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I believe this one that emerges is the son of the devil. If not the son of the devil, the spirit of the son of the devil. If Christ was the seed of the woman, Antichrist will be the seed of the serpent. Everything has a balance to it. Just as the first horseman of the apocalypse, as the seals begin to be opened, we have the first horseman of the apocalypse on that white horse. Uh, pay close attention. Many people would read that and say, see right away there, oh, white horse, beauty, purity, kindness, goodness. No, that is the pseudo false messiah. And if you pay attention again, very clearly, what does it say about this personage that appears? What happens? It says here, and then there went forth, what? It says, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a, what? A bow, right? And a crown was given unto him, was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. But no arrow, which to me suggests a, really a bloodless battle. That means you, you, whoever is going to be succumbing to this one, it'll be done bloodlessly. No violence needed. Look at how the globalists are trying to take power from the people. And it's without, thus far, it's been without any injury, by and large. Think about this. So there's something to be said there uh, when we were looking at this very carefully. His appearance, oh, he looks like such a good white horse, right? And, and no arrow, he means no harm. He is here to help us, like the government, right? <laughs> the words... We're from the government, we're here to help, right? Same concept is there. So just in the parables, as we read the good seed, for example, that was sown, we also read of the tares that were sown, the imitation weed of the enemy, and so on. So all of these symbols are through the whole book. Then we have this juxtaposition, for example, of the children of God versus the children of the wicked one. These are replete in the Bible. We are told, for example, Christ is the light of the world. Satan must transform himself into an angel of light. So, again, if somebody thinks this person is going to come on the scene and appear as an evil demon, as something wicked, you don't, you've not been reading the book. He's going to come on the scene and deceive people and make people believe he is the, the ultimate peacemaker with a peace plan and everybody is going to live peacefully. We're going to have this great peace that pours over the earth and everybody will just say, yes, this is a marvelous thing. You know, every president that has brokered a peace deal, <laughs> they've always said, could he be? Of course, they didn't read enough to know. We have, as I said, enough information to know where he will herald from. Just as Christ has a bride, the church, Satan has his whore. There are all these parallels you cannot avoid looking at. Um, just as for God, the place that is so important, and nobody, it's, it really is mind-boggling. Why is this little place, this little swath of sand, why is it so important to God, but it is Jerusalem, the epicenter of it all? And just as God has an epicenter, we have to have this person have his epicenter. You notice this resurgence of Babylon, right? Now, there's a lot of debate whether Babylon will actually be rebuilt or it personifies something. We'll have to investigate to find out. But again, here's this little area that seems very important. And look back to see who wanted to conquer, if we're looking at territory, and the mindset of those that wanted to conquer. And again, I come back to this one thing. You've got all of these empires that all wanted to conquer, and they all wanted this, what they were calling the pearl of this area, Babylon. It even drove Saddam Hussein to build on top of the old city, to rebuild. Think of, again, a little bit of nuttiness here, but in a demonic way. 
if you haven't seen these pictures, which I'm sure most of you have, but if you haven't, go online and look them up. Saddam Hussein basically tried to rebuild the splendor of Babylon, and he did it in such a terrible way. I, I can, you know, you, the man had enough money, he could have done it properly. Everything looks like, it looks like a movie set, right? But he just built right on top of what was there with blatant disregard for what was there so that even now, they're just starting to let people in to look. Good luck in trying to excavate that to see what was there. But again, the mindset to rebuild Babylon tells me that that person had to have that same spirit to reestablish the splendor. That is the driving force. Now, whether, as I said, it's a real place or it's representational, we will have to see. But the real important thing here is, as I'm showing you, there are all of these parallels as you go. Identifying them pays off big time when you're trying to put the whole tapestry together. Uh, Antichrist, the wicked one who will be revealed eventually, uh, the man of sin, the son of perdition, also depicted as losing in Isaiah's writing. There are passages in Isaiah that speak of this one in a very cryptic way will investigate. But there's one passage that says, In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish, key word there, sword, punish Leviathan, pier the piercing serpent, even Le Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. If you're not reading that carefully and if you're not looking at the Hebrew, you can't appreciate that Isaiah was envisioning something. Why? Because if you go back just a little bit before that passage, uh, 2620 says, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut the doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be passed over. So it's pretty powerful to see how even nestled into the Old Testament we've got vignettes of what God wants us to see. So um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop right here because I've got more on this subject and I'd like to complete this so we're basically compiling a profile of the person of Antichrist, of all of the nuances. Then when we get into the text, I don't need to paint the color because it would interrupt the flow of the text itself. So I want to paint this picture properly. I'm sure hoping I don't need to educate people on uh, our Savior, which is nestled, obviously, as victorious in the book of Revelation. So the important thing knowing that Christ gets the battle, wins the victory for the people that remain on the earth, and knowing that if we're analyzing this book, we already know the picture of this person who will come and who will imitate and who will deceive many. So with that in mind, this message is to be continued. We'll pick up next week on this subject. I hope you'll be here. Please, if you do not, if you miss these messages, Please catch the replay because I do not want to be doing review. Otherwise, we will be in this book for the next 20 years. <laughs> That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www dot pastor melissa scott dot com